In the fifth reading of Parshas Lech Lecha, after Abraham Avinu is greeted by Malki Tzedek, who is the king of Salem, or the future city of Yerushalayim, Malki Tzedek, we know, is actually the son of Noah, Shane. He's a, a priest of sorts. The Torah has requirements that gifts be given to the Kohen, and mm. indeed, Abraham Avinu gives gifts to this Kohen. But you must know that Abraham Avinu's gifts to Malki Tzedek did not include any of the articles that he had captured from the four kings. And he wanted to return all of this. He didn't want to take any of these articles to himself. And this is how the fifth reading opens, with Abraham Avinu having a dialogue with the king of Sodom. And the discussion is about the booty of battle. Vayemer Melech Sodom El Avram, the king of Sodom says to Avram, this is a, a meeting of the ages, the king of Sin City of antiquity is meeting the paragon of morality, the person who promulgates the idea of one God and decent righteous behavior. And they're having this strange <clears throat> meeting. And the king of Sodom, who is known for his arrogance, is suddenly at the mercy, as it were, of Abraham, the humble servant of Hashem. So the king of Sodom says, Tenli an nefesh. Okay, let's negotiate. At least give me the citizenry. Literally, give me the souls. You can take the money. I'll take the souls. Now, if you think about this, it's a very deep message here. Because Sodom says, I'm not really after your money. I want you to show them. <laughs> really want our soul. That's what we really want. But anyway, Abraham Avinu does not exactly respond as he wants this. Rashi explains that Tenli HaNefesh, the king is not asking for anything spiritual per se. He wants Min Hashvi Shali Shehitzalta HaChazali. From all of the booty you have captured, return to me HaGufim, the people, Levadam, because I won't be a king otherwise. Money, well, it's yours. You earned it fair and square. Avram El Melech Avram the great and holy paragon and teacher of godliness says to the king who led and heralded absolute immorality and arrogance that knew no borders. He said to him, I have raised my hand and sworn, if you will, to God, he was most high. Who has acquired heaven and earth? Harimoisi What's up with the hand raising? It says Rashi l'shoyin shavua. It sounds like an action, but actually, it's more of a representation of what we would call an oath. So Avraham Avinu says, "I swear by God, made him anies yodi lekelelyan. I raise my hand to God who is most high, as if to swear in His name." And we find similar things like this, of the raising of a hand and swearing, v'chein, we see, bin ishbaiti, in me you have sworn. And this is going to be later on, in chapter 22 of Genesis. Or nishbaani, I have sworn, v'chein, nasati kesef hasoder, Avraham Avinu says to them, I have already given, it says, if I have already given the money for this piece of real estate, kach me many, take it from me. It doesn't mean, it means I'm going to give you the money. What is Rashi addressing here? Abraham Avinu is not telling the king of Sodom what he has done. He's, it's his dynamic. The king of Sodom says, let's negotiate. Give me the people, you take the cash. Abraham says, I swear by God, I'm not taking anything. But Harimoisi is past tense. I am raising my hand. Not I'm raising my hand, not... Not I will raise my hand, but Harimoisi sounds like I raised my hand. So Rashi brings us another a number of examples when it comes to Shavua, when it comes to an oath, that even though the verbiage is used that we're using here seems to be non-dynamic, but rather matter-of-fact telling of what was, nonetheless, it means this is happening now. Harimoisi, Abraham is making an oath. And he says, Noisen Ani, just like he said to Ephron, I've already given you the money of the field, which he didn't give yet because Abraham Avinu is still negotiating. 
Right after that, he says, take it from me. And Abraham goes further and he says, now. Whether it be not from a thread to a shoelace. This is a euphemism. Meaning the smallest amount of money I don't want. Even the smallest of things, the modicum of value, I will not retain from all of this booty. Now Vlom goes on to say, and lest I take anything that is yours, you will not say, How will this look, my friends? The king of Sin City goes around and says, Abraham, the servant of God, yeah, of course he's wealthy. Ha! It's all from Las Vegas. He made it from my casinos. It's all from the oldest trade and all the other ways that he was pulling in cash. That's what the money is. You think you're getting holy money over there? You think, what do you think? This is contributions. Avram earned the money by the sweat of his brow. He claims that he's against immorality, but he's very happy to profit from it. Avram understood this very well. Avram says, you will never be able to say he gave me as much as a shoelace, or what we call in English today, a red cent. And if you'll say, I'll pay you at least, give me back the booty, I'll pay you. Avram says, I won't take nothing. You won't say, I made Abraham wealthy. It is God who said, he'll make me wealthy. He'll find a way. And we learned, Avarechecha means Rashi told us, Avram says, the thing is this. I can have Nasiris Nefesh. I can lay my life on the line and take every risk and then refuse payment. For myself, I can do that. But you can't make somebody else's Nasiris Nefesh. Nasiris Nefesh means to give away your soul, give away your life. Abraham said, give my life away. I can't give somebody else's life away. It's not fair for me to say people who deserve to be paid for their services, well, they, they have to work for free because I work for free. I work for free, said Abraham. They won't. Hanaorim, Abraham says, Biladi, what they will odai, but not, not for me, accepting me. But however, but except for that, Raka Shirachla Hanaorim, I just want my expenses paid. That's fair. Whatever the Na'orim ate, they're going to come and give me a bill for their, for their lunches or whatever else it was. The people, they, they need to get reimbursed. The portion of the people who went with me, they deserved what they deserved. They went to war, they risked their lives, now it's theirs. That's their thing. I can't give that away. Einar, Eshkol, and Mamre, who didn't go with Avram. But Avram speaks about their portion too. <coughs> And he says, hey, Nikhu Chalkum, they should take their portion. Rashi says, what does this mean? And ordered the young people, the young lads, Avodai, my servants, Ashahol Chuiti, they came along and they joined me. The Oid, and then in addition to that, there's Enol, Eshkel, and Mamre. Sha'avodai, Nichnusu, Lamulchama, my servants went to battle. Shenemar, as it says earlier in verse 15, Hu, Avodah, Vayakem. Avraham, his servants, and they smote them. It says they, so they were on the battle. They were in the theater. But the Einar Vechaveirav, Yoshua Lakelem Lishma, they were the home defense. They stayed and watched the homestead. And because they were national defense back home, that's another story. So they have to get paid also. And Afilo Hachi, even though they didn't actually go into battle, they were just there to watch the residuals. Hey, Miku Chalkum, they get their portion. And Avram Avinu was, if you could say, so insistent that the guards and combatants share their portion of the booty and the spoils of war, that this actually becomes a permanent custom amongst his descendants. And David HaMelech gave it the force of law. As a man who learned not David, it was from this that David learned. Shanemar David said, Kechelek HaYerdo Vachama, like the portion of those who went into the theater of battle, and those who were home, ensuring that the, the, the actual homestead is protected, they also will receive a portion. And it's it's divided 50-50. Homeland security. Homeland security, correct. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs>
In the United States, they call it the National Guard. Right. I'm not sure what it's called in Canada. Right? There's a National Guard that has, a, they're the official in case there would be an invasion of the mainland. They are the ones who protect home front. And then, I don't think so. It's the reserve. Huh? Reserve. Reserve. Yeah. Reserves. In Canada, it's reserves. But reserves in the United States are actually part of the main army. That's the army. So the United States is actually two separate, two separate, uh, sure it is. Oh, not in Canada. No, no. The United States, the National Guard is a National Guard, mm -hmm. and they wear uniforms, they have forts and whatever else it is, and centers, but they're really there to protect the actual states. Every state has its own fighting force. And, and then there's a National Army, which is National Defense, and they're the ones who, you know, who went over to Europe to fight in World War II, or the ones who went to Afghanistan and so on and so forth. At any rate, so that's the way it was structured at the time of the Jewish people's monarchy, when the Jewish people lived in Israel in peace, because they had a fighting force that defended them. There were those, the National Guard, who stayed home, and those who went out and did battle. And then I might should always learn from Avramovim. Lakach Nemar, that's why it says, from that day and onward, established it as law, giving it the force of the legal, uh, for, the full uh, legal force. Well, in Nehemiah, it doesn't say, but Allah going forward only because this idea already became established by none other than Avram Avinu himself. It's pretty interesting. So you have what's happening hundreds of years later, after the birth of a nation and the going into slavery and the coming out and the whole story, and until eventually becomes David HaMelech, and David HaMelech says, yeah, this is how we do it. What do you mean this is how we do it? We never, when do we start doing this? Avram says, when? <laughs> By the time of Avraham, Avinu says David, we've been doing it ever since when? So for those who think that the battles of Avraham are mutually exclusive of the battles of David, and I'll think again. It's one continuum. Avraham did battle in his time, and he was victorious, and David and Avraham did battle in his time. And with David and Avraham, the battles ended, and Shlomo was supposed to be peace. It was peace. But of course, unfortunately, then it was a downward descent. We disintegrated from inside. This is the end of the conversation. Conversation closed. Was Avram in it for the love or for the money? Think about this. If he was in it for the money, he would have took the money. As they say, you take the credit, I'll take the cash. Avram didn't say. He said, no, I don't need anything. It's all God. I don't want anything from you. Don't give me a red cent. He's in it for the love of God. Is he? After these words... Comes the word of God to Avram. And the word of God must come after words because it says, So we don't know what these words are. We'll soon see in Rashi. The Machaze came in a vision, a nocturnal vision. It doesn't really say Machaze Halayla, but in a vision. What exactly that means, we do not necessarily know because you have to experience it to know it. Just like somebody who never saw colors. He's blind from birth. We'll never understand what it means. He, I saw something. But we, what does it mean? He doesn't know. So we, we never had a vision. We never know what it means. But it's a Dvar Hashem. It does not necessarily uh, a broadcast. It's not necessarily an audio or a video. It's a, it's a Dvar Hashem. It's a word of God, a communication to God. It comes in some kind of vision. Maybe it comes to seeing certain imagery and knowing what God, what God meant. But the word of God came to Avram. And the word of God was, Altira Avram. Do not be fearful. I am your shield, or you don't have to, this was all on me, so to speak. You're going to get tremendous reward. One second. The thought of Rome is in it for the love, not the money. Abrahamic Amore is all about love. And here we have Abraham. God says, don't worry, the money's on the way. Check is in the mail. Check is in the mail. Abraham didn't want a check. He didn't want the money. Now he's worried about his reward. Let's take a look at Rashi. Rashi says, Which words are these? The first thing Rashi says is whenever you find the word Achar, when it says it means that this is Samuch. Achar means immediately afterwards. Abraham must have said something, must have expressed himself in some way. Immediately afterwards, God responds, when there's a Yud at the end of that word. Then it's muflog. Then it means some time later, a distant time later. And the Torah here emphasizes the words, whatever these words are, these words came immediately after the battle and the victory and the negotiation. 
Right after this, right after this whole story. After this miracle happened, namely, Shahara, I guess Hamalachim, that he killed the kings. And then, and then after he killed the kings, Hayadayek Vayemir Avram Avinu was concerned, he was worried, and he said, Shemo Kibalti, Sahar, I'll call Sid Koisai. Maybe I just cashed in all my brownie points. I got no chips left. I spent all of my virtues, all of the reward that Hashem put aside for me, I spent it on staying safe. That's what protected me during these wars. These were crazy wars, impossible battles, and Dov Ramavin was victorious. How did it happen? Nothing comes for free. It had to have a price, a price tag. I just depleted all of my spiritual bank accounts. I just used all of the reward that Hashem promised for me. And if I used all the reward that Hashem promised for me, oy vey, that's not good. So this is the Achara Dvar Ma'ela. Kibalti Sochor al Kol Tzid Koisai. So what does God say to Abraham? You're concerned that your miraculous victory represents the full compensation of your accrued merits? You think that you're supplanting other rewards with this victory of staying alive? What did God promise him? What was the rewards Hashem promised him? That he's going to have offspring and he's going to get the land of Israel and he's going to be able to continue his mission and do what he's supposed to do. And now he says, that's it. Maybe I'm not going to have children now. Maybe I'm not going to get the land of Israel now. What do I get instead? Instead I get to live. It's not bad to live, but oh, you're very, who needed this? I could have stayed away from the whole thing and I had everything coming to me. So after all this, don't be afraid. I am your shield. What does this mean? So really, Avraham Avinu seems to be concerned about two things. Number one, he's afraid min ha'inish. Maybe God's measure of judgment is now, the attribute of judgment will be arrayed against Avraham for having killed so many innocent people. Avraham Avinu is not even certain. He said, I used up my accrued merits and I don't even know. I have nothing else to spend now. How will I stand before God? So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, no thing to worry about. You have nothing to worry about. And the way the Mepharshim explained this Rashi, the word Mage means free in Aramaic. It's free. The Medrash gives us the metaphor that there was a situation of a guy who was clearing out the thistles and thorns, and then the king saw him and said, what are you doing in my garden? And the guy said, oh, the king caught me. He said, I'm sorry, I was just taking The king says, no, 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 don't worry. Take it out of here. <laughs> The king said, I always have to hire a gardener. He did me a favor. These are horrible people, monsters, rapists, ISIS members. Thank you for killing them. Thank you for eliminating them, Hashem says to Avraham Avinu. You've done a great service to God and humanity. Mogin l'cha. It's all for free. You have nothing to worry about. You haven't spent any of your accrued merits. You're worried about your reward? Nothing to worry about. Scharcha harbe ma'oid. Your reward is very great. Ram Avinu was worried about reward. And here we have what seems to be a bit of a contradiction. On one hand, Abrahamic Amore is the virtue and value we're supposed to try to commit to and follow, serving Hashem out of love. And Abraham Avinu doesn't want money, doesn't want the cash. He says, I don't want any earnings. And yet, Abraham is worried about, he's worried about rewards. So how do we understand this? The Rebbe asked this question on page Kusal of Vav Yud Gimel. Simon Yud Gimel in the Biur HaChomish. L'cha'ere ha'davar deirish biur. This needs to be better understood. Harei ha'veides Hashem shal Avraham avinu ha'isel ishma. If you want to sum up Abraham's devotion and dedication, his love and loyalty to God in a word, you would say Avraham served God for the purest reasons. There was nothing that he was looking for. No axe to grind, no profit to make. It was Lishma for the sake of serving God. In the words of the Mishnah, Shaloy al Manas Lakabel Per He wasn't looking for a payback, a reward. Kedivri Rambam. Like, for example, the words of the Rambam in the beginning of the 10th chapter of Ilchas Tshuva, where the Rambam says, Ha Oived me Ahava. Do you know what the meaning of somebody who serves God for love? Not for money. Serve God for love. 
For glove means loy mitne dover bailam, not because there's something to be achieved or gained. Veloy mitne yiras hara, not because you're afraid of punishment. Veloy kadeli de shatayva, and not to inherit the good in the future. Ela oisa es ha emes, you do the truth, mitne shahu emes. Why are you doing this? Because it's the right thing to do. What are you going to get a payback? I don't care. It's not about a payback. It's the right thing to do. I do what's right because it's right. And then Rambam says, who coined that phrase? Who is the one who came up with this methodology that I serve God doing the truth because it's true? That is the virtue of Father Abraham. Abrahamic amore. You know what amore means? Love. Love. It's a talent. It's a Latin. Amore. Amore. Abrahamic amore. <laughs> this is how we're supposed to do it. The Italians got it right. <laughs> You're supposed to do it out of love for God. How did Abraham serve God? <laughs> he only served out of love. Um, excuse me, Rabbi. If he only served out of love, how do you explain this verse? Avram experiences great anxiety, expressing concern. What will happen to my reward? Reward? You only serve God with love. What's going on over here? So the Rebbe gives us a mighty dick of beer. A mighty dick, a wonderful explanation. Avedas Hashem Lishma, serving God for the right reasons, for the purest reasons, with, with absolute sincerity. Means He's not thinking about me. Most people are into hashtag me, period. Not me too, not me yes, not me three. They're just into me. What's in it for me? That's all they want to know. Will I get rich, famous, happy, have fun? What will I get from it? The one who serves God out of love doesn't do it for me. It's not what's in it for me. It's what, what does God want? When a person is at that level, where it's not about me at all. None of us are there, by the way. But that's, this is the mild the virtue of Avram Avinu. This is what we're supposed to aspire to. Abraham reaches this level. And of course, the Medrash tells us that every one of us is obligated to say, Masai, Yavai, Maisel, Maisei, When will my actions measure up to the actions of my father is Avraham Yitzchak Yaakov. The Medrash also says, Don't try to stand in big shoes. Just remember, they, they were the greatest of the great, and we are, okay, trying to do something. So a person like that, the reward he gets is also for what? For Baruch. It's like the person in business who doesn't take a salary. So what does he do with all the profit? He puts it right back into the business. This is known as a non-profit organization. What's it meant to be that? Kishima I say when he gets wealthy. Mechabdim I say he gets honor. Bischus kiyum ateirav mitzvahs in the merit of the fulfillment of Torah mitzvahs. Who any nana mi aishavah kavod eishi? He doesn't benefit or enjoy any of that wealth, affluence, or honor. Elo mikach shem esrabek for yishamayim ba'elam. He says God's name looks better. It looks better for the cause. It's all about the cause. It's not about me at all. B'kach sha'akarayim. This way everybody can see. Hamakayim. Tere omitzvah is a person who fulfills the Torah, studies it, and fulfills the dictums. Zeichel ha'ayisha v'kavit. So this will be a great inspiration for others. A person will see somebody who learns Torah, does mitzvahs, is having a, a hell of a life, suffering a great misery. He looks at this guy and says, Oy, vey izmir. Do I want to be like that? Why would I want to learn Torah mitzvahs? Look at the last guy with Torah mitzvahs. But if the person who's learning Torah doing mitzvahs does fantastic, anybody would say, wow, learn Torah doing mitzvahs, and fantastic things happen. This inspires others to learn Torah and do mitzvahs properly. And that, my friends, is the key. This unlocks the mystery. This is how we understand Avraham Avinu's request. Mishum Avram Hoya Oivid Me'ava. Precisely because Avram served God out of love. And he did it betachlis ashlemis in the most perfect way. He did not see in the reward something personal to gain. What did he see? He saw God's honor. That's all it was about. 
If he'll be rewarded, the name of God is great. When he feared that now God's name would no longer be sanctified through him. Why? Because uh, he spent all his merits. That gave him anxiety. He wasn't worried about me. He wasn't worried about Avram. He was worried about God. He was worried about the cause. Sakadish Baruch says, Al Tira. Relax, Avram Avinu. No anxiety is necessary. You haven't spent your merits. Your reward is indeed very great. And of course, when we learn about this, we know it's way, way beyond anything we could possibly imagine. We're small people who are steeped in our own selfish desires and needs. However, we can at least learn about Avraham Avinu and try in some small way to measure up to his spiritual stature and his extraordinary greatness in his Avedis Hashem. When we try a little harder to be like Avraham Avinu, then we come a little closer to seeing the fulfillment of Avraham Avinu's mission of transforming the world by inspiring all of humanity to study, to learn, to fulfill the words of our living God. And this, of course, ushers in the coming of Mashiach. Amen. So Noah was pure.